Hello everyone, welcome back to my channel for a brand new mystery with Molly. If you are new around here, if you have never seen my face on your screen before, then hi, my name is Molly. And I post true crime videos like this every single week. So if you think that that is something that you might want to stick around for, then please do subscribe. And don't forget to switch on the little notification bell so that YouTube will let you know whenever I post a new video. This week, we are going to be talking about a serial killer case, an unsolved serial killer case actually and I don't think I've ever covered an unsolved serial killer before but this case is known as the alphabet murders and the reason for that is because each of the victims had twin initials both their first and last name began with the same letter was it purely coincidental or did this killer choose his victims because of it did he have a strange obsession with twin initials and he wanted this obsession to play a part in his murders. But quickly before we get into the case, I would just like to say a huge thank you to Function of Beauty for kindly sponsoring this section of the video. Now if you have been watching my channel for a while, I'm sure you would have had me mention Function of Beauty before. I've been using their hair care for literally years and I love them because they actually allow you to customise your products, customise your shampoo and conditioner so that they best suit your hair. All you have to do is head to the Function of Beauty website and complete their super quick quiz in which you outline your hair type and also what goals you have for your hair. So for my hair goals, I usually pick things like deep condition, fix split ends, hydrate, strengthen and oil control. In addition to this, you can also choose the scent of your products. This time I actually went for one that I had never tried before. It's called Go Coco, which is coconut with hints of honeysuckle and it is unreal. Oh my god, I think this is going to be my summer hair scent. You can also also choose the strength of your fragrance. I always go for strong because one of my favourite things is when I'm just walking along and I get a whiff of my hair. With Function of Beauty you can even have your name printed on the bottles and you can choose the colour of your products. So as you can see I went for yellow for my shampoo and this like peachy orange for my conditioner and you even get the cutest little sticker pack in your order which you can stick on the bottles. I still need to stick mine on but how sweet are they? I just adore Function of beauty. I've always been very protective of my hair. My hair has always been like my safety blanket. So it's really important to me to use products on it from brands that I trust and that is Function of Beauty. So if you would like to give them a try and treat yourself to some new hair care then now is the time to do it because if you click on the link in the description box you will be able to get 20% of your first 16 ounce custom set. I would also highly recommend becoming a member because then you you get exclusive perks such as free shipping and also early access to new products. Once again thank you so much to Function of Beauty for sponsoring this video and supporting the channel. Thank you to you guys for always supporting the sponsors on this channel and now let's just get into the case. So for this week's case, we are going back more than 50 years to 1971 in the city of Rochester in New York. And this is Carmen Cologne. She was just 10 years old at the time that this case took place. She was born on the 18th of January 1961. And she was originally from Puerto Rico. She lived there for the first half of her short life. However, the family eventually moved to Rochester in New York. And it was there where Carmen actually started living with her grandparents. You see, Carmen's mother, I do know her name, but I really don't think I'm gonna be able to pronounce it, so I'm gonna put it on screen. She was very, very young. She was just 14 years old when she became pregnant with Carmen. So it was a struggle for her to raise a child when really she was still a child herself. And I don't think Carmen's father was really in the picture. He was a lot older than her mother. And apparently he was actually her mother's older sister's partner. Partner. So her mother was basically a single parent. She was raising Carmen on her own. But as I said, Carmen eventually started living with her grandparents most of the time. And they lived on Brown Street in Rochester. But Carmen still had regular contact with her mother. They saw each other all the time. For the most part, Carmen Cologne was a happy young girl who always seemed to have a smile on her face. She was very chatty. One of the teachers at her school described her as being a bundle of joy. However, Carmen 
Carmen did struggle in school. She struggled to keep up with other kids her age and this was due to the fact that she had a learning disability but also because English was her second language. Like I mentioned she grew up in Puerto Rico so she was still trying to learn English and Carmen also suffered a lot with nightmares. She used to get really really scared at night. She would wake up in the middle of the night and just start screaming which obviously caused everyone else in the house to wake up. But despite all of this, Carmen Cologne was a young girl that wanted some independence in her life. She wanted to show her family that she wasn't a baby anymore. She was a big girl. And so on the 16th of November 1971, she decided to prove this by walking to the nearby pharmacy on her own. The pharmacy was just around the corner from her home on the north side of West Main Street. And Carmen would often go there to pick up a prescription for a family member although she didn't usually go on her own most of the time she was accompanied by her grandfather but on this particular day she was given permission to walk there on her own after she repeatedly kept asking her mother to let her do so so Carmen left her house and she arrived at the pharmacy at around 4 30 that afternoon although when she arrived the prescription wasn't actually ready and the man behind the counter later said that Carmen did didn't seem keen to wait. She apparently kept saying, I've got to go, I've got to go. And so she was told to just come back a little bit later when the prescription would be ready. And with that, Carmen left the store. However, she never returned to the pharmacy to collect the prescription and she never returned home. After she left the store that day, 10 year old Carmen Cologne disappeared. When Carmen didn't come home, her family went out searching for her. They were searching the streets and shouting her name but sadly they had no luck there was no sign of her and so after a couple of hours the Rochester police were contacted and Carmen was reported as missing so an investigation into the disappearance of Carmen Cologne began and actually it wasn't long before the police concluded that Carmen had probably been abducted according to a few sources after she left the pharmacy that day she was seen by a couple of people getting into a car that was parked nearby and then just an hour later she was spotted again this time by several witnesses possibly even hundreds the last time Carmen Cologne was ever seen alive was around 5 30 p.m on the 16th of November on the hard shoulder of interstate 490 roughly 12 miles away from her home a girl matching Carmen's description was seen literally running along the interstate and and this young girl was clearly in trouble. She was crying, she was screaming for help, she was naked from the waist down and she was waving her arms trying to get the attention of cars that were passing. And a lot of cars did pass her. This was around rush hour so there were a lot of cars driving on the interstate and yet unbelievably not a single person stopped. Many many people later came forward after Carmen Cologne went missing saying that they did see her running on the side of the road but at the time not one of these cars stopped to help her to see if she was okay and several of these witnesses said that they didn't just see Carmen they saw a car behind her that was kind of backing up and reversing as if it was trying to catch up to her and other witnesses also described having seen a man running after her and this is of course one of the most insane parts of this whole case this really caused a public uproar. The fact that this half-naked screaming young girl was seen running along the expressway and yet the motorist just continued driving and as I said that was the last time that Carmen was ever seen alive because just two days after this her dead body was found. She was found by two young boys near an area called Churchville in Rochester which is just over 16 miles away from Brown Street where Carmen lived. She was discovered just dumped in a ditch and she had been murdered and of course it's believed that she was killed by that man that she was seen running away from on the interstate. Clearly he eventually caught up to her and he forced her back into his car and it's just so frustrating and heartbreaking knowing that there was an opportunity
opportunity to save her countless opportunities so many people saw Carmen that day and if just one of them had stopped she probably would have been saved but I do think it's important to take into consideration the actual location where Carmen was seen along the interstate where cars would have been driving very very fast around like 70 miles an hour so they only would have seen Carmen for a few seconds if that and I imagine by the time they would have actually processed what they had seen it would have been too late for them to stop and turn around maybe most of the motorists just assumed that other cars would stop and so they just continued driving and maybe initially they didn't think that what they saw was as serious and sinister as it actually was it's possible that witnesses just thought that the man that was running after Carmen was her father or a relative or something. Perhaps she was having a bit of a tantrum and she ran out of the car. Maybe the reason she was naked from the waist down was because she needed the toilet and so they stopped on the side of the road. There might have been a couple of different scenarios going through people's minds. Back then in the early 70s it is very unlikely that people's first thoughts would have been that is a child being abducted. Carmen's cause of death was determined to have been strangulation. She had been manually strangled from the front and it was determined that she had been dead for at least 24 hours before she was discovered on the 18th of November. She was partially nude. A few items of her clothing that she was wearing on the day that she was last seen were missing. However, her coat that she was wearing that day was eventually discovered, just discarded about 100 yards away from her body and her trousers were also discovered I believe just on the side of the road not too far from where she was last seen. As well as the strangulation Carmen also suffered other injuries. She had sadly been raped and it is stated on a few sources that she had a fracture to her skull and her vertebrae and she also had just a load of scratches all over her body, fingernail scratches indicating that she really put up a fight. She tried so hard to fight off her attacker and escape. So following the discovery of Carmen's body, a murder inquiry was launched. The hunt was on to find the monster that did this to her and quickly before he potentially struck again. Now eyewitnesses described the car that they saw Carmen running away from on the interstate as being a dark colour and they said that it looked quite expensive for the time. Some witnesses said that they believed it may have been a Ford Pinto car whereas others said that they thought it was a Cadillac or a Lincoln. So unfortunately because the police didn't know the exact make and model of the vehicle that made it incredibly difficult to try and track down. Now a lot of people believe that the details surrounding Carmen's abduction suggest that she may have actually known the identity of her killer. For starters if you recall I said that the police received some information from witnesses who said that they saw Carmen getting into a parked car after she left the pharmacy that afternoon. She wasn't dragged or forced into the car, she got in willingly, suggesting probably one of two things. Number one, maybe if her abductor was a stranger, she was lured into the vehicle somehow. Or number two, she knew the person driving and so she wouldn't have felt as though she was in any danger. It's been theorised that maybe while she was on her way to the pharmacy she was approached by her killer and he managed to persuade her to go with him after she picked up the prescription. Perhaps that's why she seemed to be in a rush in the pharmacy. Remember she kept saying I've got to go, I've got to go. Is that because she knew that someone was waiting for her outside? Something else that suggests that she may have known her attacker is the fact that he chased after her along the interstate after Carmen escaped the vehicle and started running. Because if Carmen was abducted by a stranger it seems more likely that after she fled from the car the attacker would just give up and carry on driving because he knew that there were a lot of people around, a lot of cars going past. But the fact that he didn't do that, he got out of the car and he started running after her indicates that she knew who he was and he could not risk her escaping because she would be able to tell her family and the police 
police who abducted her. In an attempt to generate some more tips in the case, a reward of $6,000 was offered to anyone with any information regarding the identity of Carmen Cologne's killer. And a couple of these huge billboards were created and displayed along Rochester Expressways. These billboards again urged anyone with any information to come forward. And as a result of all of this, the police did receive countless potential leads and they did question a number of men in relation to this case but they could never concretely link any of them to the murder and so they were all let go without charge but there was one man that came under suspicion after Carmen's murder which many people still believe to this day was her killer however we're going to talk more about him a little later on in the video when we talk about the rest of the suspects according to a book I read about this case during my research one day following Carmen's murder the police were called to a department store on Main East Street in Rochester because of something very very disturbing that had been written on the door to the men's bathroom on this door someone wrote quote I killed a 10 year old girl who will be next so immediately everyone believed that the person who did this was talking about Carmen Cologne she was the 10 year old that they were referring to when the police arrived at the scene they dusted the door for fingerprints however from what I can gather not much really came from this I don't believe they ever found the person that wrote this on the door Carmen's case was very well known at this point pretty much everyone knew of her murder so it's entirely possible Possible that it was written by just some sick individual playing a twisted joke or who knows maybe it was actually written by the real killer and this graffiti on the door was basically a warning he was going to strike again and less than two years after Carmen's murder it appeared as though if that was the killer that wrote that on the bathroom door he may have followed through with his threats unfortunately as the months and the years went by Carmen's case started to go quiet and go cold the investigation really slowed down however in April of 1973 the Rochester police had another horrific crime on the their hands a crime that was incredibly similar to the murder of Carmen Cologne and so for that reason people immediately theorized that they were linked Wanda Walkowitz was an 11 year old girl who in the early 70s lived with her family in an apartment in an area called Conkey Avenue on the east side of Rochester. Wanda was born on the 4th of August 1961. Her mother was called Joyce and I couldn't actually find the name of her father. Unfortunately he passed away when Wanda was still very young. However her mother Joyce did have another partner, a man named Junior who lived with the family so he was kind of like Wanda's stepfather although apparently he had a criminal record and according to one source he and Joyce would get drunk very often so Wanda did not really have the best home life a documentary that I watched about this case described how she kind of had to look after herself and fend for herself at just 11 years old Wanda's aunt described her as being a sweetheart but she was also very very feisty she could hold her own she did didn't always get along very well with the other kids at school and she would sometimes get into arguments and fights but she was not afraid of confrontation she could defend herself on the afternoon of the 2nd of April 1973 Wanda was sent out to run an errand for her mother she went to the local grocery store which was only a couple of blocks away from her home and she picked up some groceries she did make it there she arrived at the store she brought the groceries the employees in the store did later say that it seemed as though she was in a bit of a rush to leave similar to Carmen Cologne when she was picking up the prescription but apparently that was quite normal for Wanda I think she often went into that store to pick up stuff for her mum and she was often in a hurry she was probably just bored what child wants to hang around in a grocery store for longer than they need to however this particular day wasn't like any other on this particular day day Wanda Walkowitz never returned home she disappeared when Wanda didn't come home I believe her sister Ruth went out looking for her 
but she had no luck and so later that evening her mother Joyce rang the Rochester police to report her 11 year old daughter as missing. Joyce actually rang the police twice to file this report however they didn't seem to take it very seriously the first time. They actually told Joyce to just go out herself and search the neighbourhood for Wanda and then if she still can't find her ring back. So that's exactly what Joyce did. She went out to search. She went to the grocery store to see if for some reason Wanda was still there but of course she wasn't. There was no sign of her and so Joyce rang the police back and that's when the investigation into Wanda's disappearance really began. The police were immediately dispatched to the area where she lived and they began the search for both Wanda and also any trace of the bag of groceries that she had with her when she left the store and it wouldn't be too long before they found her but sadly when they did she was no longer alive. Just the next morning on the 3rd of April 1973 about 10 miles away from Wanda's home in a town called Webster Wanda's dead body was discovered at the bottom of a hillside just off of Route 104. She was found by a state trooper she was lying face down on the ground and it was actually determined that she hadn't just been placed there. Her body had basically been dropped at the top of the hill and allowed to just roll down to the bottom. Wanda had been murdered. It was concluded in her autopsy that her cause of death was strangulation just like Carmen Cologne. Although the medical examiner said that he believed Wanda was strangled from behind with something like a bout rather than manually strangled. She did have a couple of self-defense injuries on her body like marks and scratches indicating that she had tried to fight off her attacker and she had also sadly been raped. However she was fully clothed when she was found so the police believed that she was raped elsewhere. She was then told by her attacker to put her clothes back on and then she was killed and her body was taken to the area where it was later found. Now interestingly the medical examiner also discovered that Wanda had custard in her stomach at the time that she died. However, her family said that she didn't have this at home. So that means that her killer was actually the one that gave it to her. He fed her before killing her. Wanda was seen by a couple of people on the afternoon that she disappeared. There were a few people that saw her walking in the direction of her home, struggling to carry the heavy bag of groceries. However, the last ever sighting of Wanda Walker was about an hour after she went to the grocery store. A witness saw a girl matching her description holding a bag of groceries not too far from the store and she was standing on the side of the street next to a parked car. Some sources say that it was a brown coloured car and she was kind of leaning in talking to the driver and it looked as though the driver was trying to persuade her to get into the vehicle and she was deciding whether or not to get in. So for that reason, the police, of course, instantly believed that the driver of this car was the perpetrator. He abducted her that afternoon and killed her. However, Wanda's mother, Joyce, said that Wanda was very, very street smart. She would never have accepted a lift from a stranger. She just knew not to do that. And there were no witness reports that suggested that she was forced into the car. No one saw Wanda in distress. No one saw her getting into a vehicle, kicking and screaming. So does that mean that she perhaps knew her attacker or she knew of them and so she got in willingly because she wouldn't have felt as though she was in any danger? Maybe the driver of the car saw her struggling with the heavy bag of groceries and so he offered her a lift home but of course that was not actually his intention. Instead of dropping her home he kidnapped her. Although interestingly when Wanda's body was found and her clothing was examined scientists actually found traces of white cat hairs and her family didn't have a white cat so one theory that the police developed was that maybe the cat hairs had come from Wanda's killer's cat. Maybe if she was lured into his vehicle that's what he used to do it. He said to her that she could come and stroke and play with his cat if she got in the car. Perhaps he also persuaded her to get in by telling her that he would give her some custard as well. Now as I'm sure you've picked up on, there were quite a few similarities between Wanda's case and the case of Carmen Cologne, which happened about a year and five months earlier. They were both young girls, there was just a year difference.
difference between them. Carmen was 10 when she was killed, whereas Wanda was 11. From what I can gather, Wanda also had learning difficulties, just like Carmen. She sometimes struggled a bit in school. They both came from relatively poor families. They both vanished whilst they were out on their own running an errand for a family member. They were both seen either getting into a parked car or having a conversation with the driver of a parked car. They had both been raped and they had both been strangled to death and then their bodies were dumped in um, similar kind of rural quiet areas. But having said all of that, there were also a couple of differences between the two murders. So for example, there's the fact that Wanda was found fully clothed whereas Carmen was kind of half naked. After Wanda was assaulted, the killer had instructed her to put her clothes back on but the same could not be said for Carmen. Also there was a contrast in the way that they had actually been killed. Yes they had both been strangled but Carmen was manually strangled from the front whereas Wanda was strangled with a bout from behind and I'm sure you guys know this if you watch true crime videos regularly but it is very very rare that a killer will switch up how they actually end their victim's life. They will usually just find a method that they like that works for them and they will stick to it. Another difference was the fact that Wanda seemed to have eaten before her death. Her killer gave her some custard but again the same could not be said for Carmen. So whilst there were many similarities between Carmen Cologne's murder and the murder of Wanda Walkowitz there were also differences. So I think the police were kind of torn on whether or not to believe that they were connected. They weren't sure if the man that killed Carmen was the same man that killed Wanda. They couldn't really rule out either possibility. It was definitely possible that they were killed by the same man but also possible that they weren't and the police were dealing with two separate child murderers in the Rochester area but there was one very similar detail about these two crimes that really stood out to the police and that was the fact that both victims had double initials. So obviously Carmen was Carmen Cologne, her initials were CC and and Wanda Walkowitz's initials were WW. They also noticed that their initials matched the areas where their bodies were found. So Carmen's body was found in Churchville in Rochester. Churchville begins with C. And Wanda was found in Webster. So they just thought that that was quite interesting. Of course they knew that it might have been a bit far-fetched. They might have been looking a bit too much into it. But who knows? Maybe there was a possible connection there. Maybe if the cases were linked and they were murdered by the same man, this was a killer that had a weird obsession and fascination with double initials and that's why he chose Carmen and Wanda as victims because of the fact that their first and last names began with the same letter. But then that to me suggests that he must have known them. He wasn't a stranger because otherwise how could he have known when he abducted them that they had the same initials? Unless he was literally driving around the streets asking kids their names until he just happened to come across one that had twin initials. Maybe if he was a stranger, he had been stalking the girls for a while before he kidnapped them. He had been following them and watching them and somehow through doing that he found out their names, I don't know. But yeah, the police weren't really sure what to think, whether or not the cases were connected, but one thing was for sure and that was that the local community were absolutely terrified. Parents in Rochester were terrified because there was at least one child killer on the loose in the city, possibly even two. And it didn't seem as though the police were getting close to catching them anytime soon. What once felt like a relatively safe area was now the complete opposite. And parents were so, so scared to let their children go out alone in fear that they would be snatched and murdered next. The investigation into both cases continued. A reward for information was put forward in relation to Wanda's case, just like with Carmen. And the police 
police did receive countless tips and leads from the public which they followed up on. A billboard detailing Wanda's murder was made following the discovery of her body just like the billboards that were made following Carmen's death and the first line on Wanda's billboard read quote it happened again and one man that the police actually questioned very shortly after Wanda's body was found was someone that she had had an encounter with before. Basically a couple of years earlier in 1971 this random older man approached Wanda and offered to pay her a dime if she gave him kisses. So he was immediately one of the top suspects when she was found murdered because he was clearly a paedophile that was interested in Wanda. However from what I can gather he was ultimately ruled out of the inquiry and then just six months after the murder of Wanda Walkowitz another young girl disappeared from the streets of Rochester. Michelle Mayenza was 10 years old in late 1973. She was born in November of 1961. Her mother was called Carolyn, her father was called Christopher and Michelle was one of five children. She had two sisters and two brothers. Her mother and father were no longer together at the time that this case happened and Michelle lived with her mum but her dad only lived about a mile away so I believe she still saw him quite often. Michelle lived in a house on Webster Crescent in Rochester and the family didn't really have much money but they were getting by and from what I could tell Michelle had a relatively normal average home life. However the same could not be said for Michelle's life at school just like Carmen and Wanda, Michelle also really, really struggled at school. She had learning difficulties, but she was also bullied relentlessly by other kids. I don't think she really had many, if any, friends, and she was just teased constantly. She was called horrible names. They made fun of her appearance. And on the afternoon of the 26th of November, 1973, Michelle went to the school nurse's office in tears after her peers bullied her during recess. She was literally in the nurse's office all afternoon just crying because of it. But eventually when she calmed down a bit, she left school sometime around 3.30 p.m. And apparently instead of heading home, she headed to a shopping plaza not not too far from her school. It was called the Goodman Plaza of Stores. And according to some sources, she headed there because she was running an errand for her mother. One source said that she needed to pick up her mother's purse because her mother had recently left it there accidentally. Michelle was seen by a couple of people near the shopping plaza that afternoon, one of which was an uncle of hers. His name was Phil. And he actually said to Michelle that he could give her a lift home if she wanted, but she declined. She wanted to walk back on her own. However, Michelle never made it home that afternoon. She just completely disappeared and around 5.40pm her mother Carolyn reported her as missing to the police. So now the police had a third disappearance on their hands and right away I think one of the immediate theories was that maybe Michelle had actually run away. We know that she had a horrible, horrible time at school that day. I mean, she had a horrible day at school every day because of the bullying. So perhaps she had decided that she had had enough. She decided to just leave. However, her family, her mother specifically, did not believe that for one minute. She did not believe that her daughter had just left of her own accord. She was certain that something much more sinister had happened and the police soon received information from a witness which seemed to imply that that in fact was the case. A witness remembered seeing a young girl matching Michelle's description sitting in the passenger seat of a car which was either um, like a beigey colour or a tan kind of colour and then the witness observed a man getting into the driver's seat of the car carrying a cup and a bag and interestingly this witness remembered that the man had really really dirty hands. I don't know what was on them whether it was like mud or dirt or something but they just remembered him having dirty hands and I believe this account was further backed up by another witness, a young girl named Cynthia who actually knew Michelle Mayenza personally and she also said that she saw her, she saw Michelle sitting in a car next to an older man that afternoon. Cynthia actually witnessed the 
the car driving away and she said that it was driving so so fast that it was close to hitting another car it was clearly in a hurry to get away the police also received information about another potential sighting of michelle from around 5 30 p.m that day this potential sighting was reported by a motorist who was driving along route 350 through a town called walkworth when he spotted a car on the side of the road that looked as though it had possibly broken down or had a flat tire or something and there was a man standing next to the vehicle and he was holding a young girl by the hand a young girl who matched the description of michelle mayenza and the car was like a beige or a tan color just like the kind of car that the other witnesses described seeing so thinking that this man on the side of the road might have needed some assistance with his vehicle the motorist stopped and offered to howl but as soon as he did he noticed that the man grabbed the young girl and pushed her behind his back and he also stood in front of the license plate as though he didn't want the motorist to see it and he literally glared at the motorist he basically gave him like a death stare and so the motorist just left and those are believed to have been the last ever sightings of Michelle Mayenza alive because just two days later on the morning of the 28th of November she was found dead she was discovered by a member of the public in a ditch on the side of a road in a town called Macedon in Wayne County which is about 15 miles away from Rochester. Michelle was fully clothed when she was found although apparently her coat that she was wearing on the day that she vanished was found just discarded in another location about 70 yards away. It seemed as though she had been dropped in the ditch similar to Wanda. She had been dropped and allowed to just roll down. She had been raped and she'd also suffered blunt force trauma to the head but ultimately her cause of death was strangulation and it's believed that she was strangled with either a rope or a bout although interestingly a partial palm print was discovered on her neck suggesting that perhaps the killer also used their hands to strangle her. When Michelle was found the police actually discovered that she was clutching some dry foliage in one of her hands and this foliage apparently matched the foliage from the area where her body was found suggesting that she had been murdered nearby and as she was being killed she must have grabbed some leaves and was just clutching them. The contents of her stomach showed that Michelle had eaten a hamburger not long before her death, probably only about an hour, an hour and a half before she died. And actually the police did receive another reported sighting of a girl matching Michelle's description being seen either in or near a fast food restaurant on the afternoon that she disappeared and she was accompanied by an older man. So perhaps that was Michelle and just like Wanda Walkowitz, Michelle's killer fed her before strangling her to death. So again, maybe that's how he lured her into his car. He promised her that he would buy her some food. What the police also discovered on Michelle's clothing was some white cat hairs. Again, just like Wanda Walkowitz. So that may also be how he persuaded Michelle to get into his vehicle. He enticed her in with his cat. So the evidence indicates that this was the same killer. Again, there were many similarities between the three cases, especially between the cases of Michelle and Wanda. So for example, what I just mentioned, the fact that they were both fed before their deaths and the white cat hairs. But one of the biggest similarities between all three cases was of course the double initials. They all had them, Carmen Cologne, Wanda Walkowitz and Michelle Mayenza. And Michelle's body was also left in an area beginning with M. Macedon. Just like Carmen was left in Churchville and Wanda was left in Webster. So was it really just a coincidence? If they were all killed by the same man, did he abduct three young girls that just happened to all have twin initials? Was it purely coincidental? Or was it planned? Did he plan to only kill young girls with double initials because he had some kind of strange obsession with that? Because of the similarities, the police did strongly suspect that it was the same perpetrator. They had a child serial killer on their hands. But of course, they still couldn't entirely rule out the possibility that the cases were not 
links. So they had to keep looking into kind of both scenarios. Following the murder of Michelle, the police actually created a composite sketch alongside the witness who saw Michelle in that car on the afternoon that she disappeared, sitting next to the man with dirty hands. This witness was able to get a pretty good look at his face, and so she assisted the police in creating the sketch, which is the picture on screen right now. He was described as being a white male around six foot tall. He had dark hair and he was probably aged somewhere between 25 to 35. So this composite sketch was released to the public in the hopes that obviously someone would recognize him and come forward. For the third time, the police appealed to the people of Rochester for information and they received thousands and thousands of tips, a couple of which were the witness statements and reported sightings of Michelle that we've already discussed. And the police continued looking into all of the other leads. They took statements, they questioned several men, they looked into known sex offenders. But unfortunately, nothing seemed to bring them any closer to positively identifying the murderer. And once again, as the months and the years went by, Michelle's case started to go cold. Just like the cases of Carmen and Wanda. And unfortunately, that is how the cases remain to this day. More than five decades later, the case of the Alphabet Killer remains unsolved. These poor three little girls have never received any justice for their brutal murders. Now, you may be thinking, was there any evidence in this case in terms of DNA? And to be honest, there isn't too much information online that I could find about this. Different sources seem to say different things. Obviously this case did happen in the early 70s when forensic technology was not a thing yet so they wouldn't have been able to get a DNA profile of the offender from the evidence or the crime scenes back then like scientists can now today. From what I can gather they did collect traces of the killer semen from each of the victims bodies and their clothing however as I understand it when tests were carried out on this semen years later scientists were only able to get a DNA profile from the semen in Wanda Walkowitz's case. I think by the time these tests were carried out the semen collected in Carmen's case so from her body and the semen from Michelle's body that evidence had um what's the word like degraded so much time had passed that they weren't able to extract the killer's DNA from it. That's what I can understand anyway from the sources that I came across so they only had the the offender's DNA in Wanda's case, which I guess is the main reason why they've never been able to concretely link the three cases, because they don't have DNA evidence in all three to compare. And of course, to this day, the police have never had a hit. They've never found a match to Wanda's killer's DNA. But that's not to say that there haven't been any pretty big suspects in the case over the years. There have been a couple of top suspects, which we are going to go through now. And I'd be really interested to hear in the comments whether you think any of them were the real killer. Although the first one we are going to talk about was really only a suspect in the case of the first victim, 10-year-old Carmen Cologne. It was actually Carmen's own uncle, Miguel Cologne. I believe he was one of Carmen's father's brothers and according to one source he had um, a bit of a relationship with Carmen's mother at one point. Miguel was someone that Carmen knew well and the reason he became a suspect in her murder was because just a couple of days after she was abducted and found dead, instead of staying in Rochester to be with the rest of the family during this very very difficult time, he actually decided to just up and leave. He moved back to Puerto Rico where the family were from originally and he told a friend of his that the reason he was leaving was because he quote had done something wrong in Rochester and in addition to that the police also discovered that he owned a car that matched the description of the car that was seen on the hard shoulder of Interstate 490 on the day that Carmen was abducted. The car that the young girl matching Carmen's description was seen running away from. So the police went and they saw 
searched Miguel's vehicle to see if they could find any evidence in there that linked to Carmen. And in the back seat, they did find a toy that belonged to her. However, that, of course, doesn't necessarily prove that he was the one who killed her. He was her uncle, and the clone family said that it is possible that Carmen may have just left her toy in his car accidentally prior to her disappearance. But the toy wasn't the main thing that alarmed the police when they searched his car. They actually found that it had recently been meticulously cleaned. The entire car had been cleaned. The trunk, the back seat, the front seats, the outside of the car, everywhere. Now again, this doesn't necessarily prove anything. It's not solid evidence to prove that he killed Carmen, but it is quite concerning. Did he deep clean it in an attempt to get rid of any evidence, perhaps blood. So he really did become the main suspect in Carmen's murder. And so the police obviously wanted to find him. They wanted to track him down so that they could question him. They eventually found out that he had fled to Puerto Rico, I believe specifically the capital of Puerto Rico. So in March of 1972, about five months after Carmen was killed, the police traveled there to try and locate him. However, Miguel actually found out about this. By this point, him being a suspect was all over the news. Everyone knew that the police suspected him of Carmen's murder. And so when the police travelled to Puerto Rico, it was all that anyone was talking about. It was in the local press and Miguel found out about this. He heard that the police were coming for him and so he had time to flee again. He got on a plane and he went on the run somewhere else. However, not long after this, he did give himself up and he was extradited back to Rochester. He was interviewed by the detectives and he was asked where he was, what he was doing on the day that his niece Carmen disappeared. And I don't actually know what he said, but apparently his alibi, whatever it was, was not a very strong one. And so he couldn't be ruled out of the inquiry. But equally, he couldn't be arrested or charged with anything because the only evidence the police had against him was circumstantial at best. They had nothing concrete to prove that he was guilty and so he ultimately had to be let go. And then 20 years after the crime in 1991 when he was around 44 years old, Miguel Colon committed suicide by shooting himself in the head. And he has never officially been ruled out of Carmen's murder. To many he remains the top suspect, the most likely suspect in in her case to this day. But if he was the one that killed Carmen, then that means that the alphabet murders probably weren't connected. Investigators have said that although Miguel Colon was a suspect in Carmen's case, he was never really a suspect in the cases of Wanda Walkowitz and Michelle Mayenza. They don't believe that he killed them. They don't believe he had anything to do with their murders. So again, the police were kind of working on a few different theories. Either Miguel killed Carmen and someone else killed Wanda and Michelle. Miguel was innocent and Carmen was killed by the same man that later murdered the other two girls. Or Carmen was killed by another man that has just never been identified and Wanda and Michelle were killed by someone else. But moving on from Miguel, let's talk about the second suspect in the case. A suspect that you guys may have actually heard of before. Kenneth Bianchi otherwise known as the Hillside Strangler, one of the Hillside Stranglers. Kenneth Bianchi was an American serial killer who, alongside his cousin, Angelo Buono Jr., murdered 12 young women. I believe they killed 10 of these women together and then Kenneth Bianchi killed two others on his own. They operated in Los Angeles in California between October of 1977 and February of 1978 before they were finally apprehended in early 1979. I've never done a video about the Hillside Stranglers but definitely let me know in the comments if you would like to see one and I will get round to doing that at some point. It's a really interesting case. But back to Kenneth Bianchi, he became a suspect in this case, the Alphabet Murders case, not long after he was arrested because the police actually discovered that at the time the Alphabet Murders were committed between 1971 and 1973, 
he was living in Rochester in New York. I believe he was born and he grew up in Rochester actually. He had lived there for most of his life so he knew the area very well and of course he definitely would have been capable of committing these horrific crimes. Most of the hillside strangler victims were adult women. But a few of them were children close to the ages of the alphabet murder victims. I believe the youngest hillside strangler victim was just 12 years old. According to sources, at the time of the killings, Bianchi drove a car that matched the description of the car that was seen by witnesses near the area where one of the girls were last seen. And he apparently worked as an ice cream vendor near the areas where two of the girls disappeared from. So perhaps if he was the killer, he used ice cream to persuade the girls to get into his car. So because of all of this, the police knew that they needed to investigate him as a potential person of interest. He denied it. He has always denied it. He was always adamant that he was not responsible and the police could never find any solid evidence to prove otherwise, to prove that he was involved. So he was never charged with anything in relation to this case. And a documentary that I watched about this case states that he has now pretty much been ruled out as a suspect. Kenneth Bianchi was apparently eliminated when that partial palm print that was found on Michelle Mayanza's neck did not match his print. Another suspect in the case was a man named Dennis Termini. Now he was around 25 years old at the time of the murders in the early 70s and he worked as a firefighter in Rochester. However, he was also a sex offender, a repeat sex offender. He raped at least 14 young women and girls between 1971 and 1973 and he became known as the garage rapist. Similar to the other suspects, at the time of the alphabet murders, he also apparently owned a car that matched the description of the car that the suspect drove. He had a beige coloured car and he actually lived in a house that was pretty close to the area where the third victim, Michelle Mayenza, was last seen alive. And in January of 1974, so just five weeks after Michelle was killed, Dennis Termini actually attempted to abduct a teenage girl, probably with the intention of raping her. He held this terrified girl at gunpoint, but that did not stop her from screaming at the top of her lungs. And she did not stop, and so he he panicked and released her and fled the scene. However, following this, he just tried to abduct another young girl. And by this point, the police had been made aware of what he was doing. And so they were onto him. They tried to apprehend him. And this clearly scared him because instead of just surrendering or trying to go on the run, he shot himself in the head and he died. Following his death, the police decided to investigate him to determine whether or not he might have been responsible for the alphabet murders and they searched his car, the beige one, to see if they could find any evidence in there linking him to the crime. And interestingly, they did find something. They found white cat hairs, just like the cat hairs that were found on Wanda and Michelle's clothing. Years and years later, in 2007, Dennis Termini's remains were actually exhumed so that scientists could attempt to obtain his DNA. They wanted to compare it to the semen that was collected from Wanda Walkowitz's body. However, when they did, they found that it was not a match and so he has also pretty much been ruled out of the inquiry. And the fourth and final suspect that I have to share with you is a man named Joseph Naso. Now in 2011 he was arrested and subsequently convicted of the murders of four women in California between 1977 and 1994. So it was a long time before he was actually caught and in 2013 he was actually sentenced to death for what he did. And would you believe it, those four women that he killed all had double initials. Their first and last names started with the same letter. There was Roxanne Rogash, Tracy Tafoya, Pamela Parsons, and you're not going to believe this, but he also had a victim named Carmen Cologne. She was 22 years old at the time of her death, and she had the exact same name as the first victim in this case, as 10-year-old Carmen Cologne, which is just insane. So when he was apprehended, the 
the police decided to look into him as a potential suspect in this alphabet murders case, the one we're talking about. Now, it was determined that he did actually live in Rochester in New York at the time of the abductions and killings. Apparently, he would often travel between New York and California. However, that the fact that he lived in Rochester and the whole double initials thing were really the only things that linked him to this case. And of course, it doesn't prove anything. It doesn't prove that he was the perpetrator. But ultimately, when his DNA was compared to the semen evidence, it was found not to be a match. And so he too has been pretty much eliminated as a suspect. Those are the four top suspects that there have been in this case. But like I said, none of them were convicted of these murders. And to this day, the case of the Alphabet murders remains officially unsolved. The police still don't know whether the cases are linked or not. They don't know if Carmen was killed by the same man that killed Wanda and Michelle. And I would love to hear what you guys think about that in the comments. Do you think that they were all murdered by the same person? Or do you think that two people were responsible for these horrific crimes? And if they were linked, do you think that this killer really chose his victims based on their double initial names? Definitely let me know your thoughts in the comments. I'm really looking forward to chatting to you guys about this one. As always, do let me know of any other cases that you would like to see me cover on this channel. You can let me know in the comments or I'll Alternatively, I do have a case request form linked in the description box of all of my videos. Thank you all so, so much for watching. Please do give this video a thumbs up and subscribe if you haven't already. And I will see you again next week for another mystery with Molly.